It was the year in which King Uzziah died, and Isaiah was in trouble, real trouble. And it wasn't just Isaiah either, it was his entire nation which was coming under the judgment of God, Isaiah included. And so in his distress and despair, he cried out, and he said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, may I say how enjoyable it is to talk about somebody else's troubles for a change? <laughs> But this morning we do continue our series on when trouble comes, and actually I think we'll find out Isaiah's troubles are also our own troubles. Now to really understand the trouble that Isaiah was in, uh, you need to understand the full context of this passage. Isaiah was a prophet, and therefore he was the mouthpiece of God. He was somebody who spoke God's true, pure words. Some of uh, the words that Isaiah spoke were favorable. Not a lot of them, but some of them. And many of these would be familiar to you. Isaiah promised a light shining out of darkness. He said a virgin would conceive and bear a son. He said that those who wait on the Lord will mount up like eagles, that a righteous servant would be crushed for our iniquities and wounded for our transgressions. Isaiah promised all of that, and yet many of his words were weighted with divine judgment, and one of the best places to see this is in the chapter that comes right before our text. Frankly, Isaiah 6 is one of those familiar Bible passages that many Christians don't understand as well as they think they do. A lot of people know verse 4 of chapter 6. In fact, we've sung it in our worship this morning. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And a lot of people know verse 8, one of the great missionary texts in the Bible. In fact, you perhaps have uh, seen it across the chest of one of your favorite football players this fall. Here am I, send me. Very inspiring. But I wonder how many Christians know the verses that come right after that verse, or the verses that come before. To understand a text, you also have to know the, the context. And if you turn back to Isaiah chapter 5, you find Isaiah pronouncing judgment upon judgment against the people of God. He describes here a carefully tended vine planted by God himself, which is not bearing any fruit. And that's a metaphor for Israel, not growing good spiritual fruit. What's very striking about Isaiah 5 is the pronouncement of God's woe. Six times Isaiah uses this word woe, and he laments the sins of the people of God. You see it in verse 8. He's lamenting unjust affluence. Woe to those who join house to house and field to field. He laments their drunkenness. Verse 11, woe to those who run after strong drink, who tarry late into the evening as wine inflames them. He laments their dishonesty. In verse 18, woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of falsehood. He goes on in verse 20 to lament their moral relativism, those who call good evil and evil good. He laments their intellectual pride. Verse 21, woe. There you see the word again, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. And then verse 23, a woe of lament for injustice. I read down the list of the sins that Isaiah was confronting in his culture, and I ask myself the question, what would Isaiah say to us? Maybe we'd rather not know. If you're like me, I don't particularly enjoy having my sins pointed out. But I suspect that Isaiah would say many of the same things to us that he said to ancient Israel. Woe to us if we use wealth for selfish privilege, or if we abuse alcohol or other pleasures, or if we bend the truth to 
improve our own image or if we shrink the ethical teaching of Scripture to make it fit better with our own sinful desires. And woe to us for thinking that the woes in Isaiah 5 are really good for someone else, you know, somebody that you really hope is listening to what's being said rather than realizing that God is actually speaking to you. Do not be wise in your own eyes, like Isaiah talks about. But can we admit we don't have it all together yet spiritually either? Which brings us to what I think is one of the most amazing things about this past passage. I think it's striking that Isaiah pronounces six woes in chapter 5. It's woe to this person and woe to that person and woe to those people over there. And I would somewhat expect, if this prophecy is going to, to be complete, to find a seventh woe. I mean, that's the biblical number of completion. And I would expect, that, therefore, as I read, to find not just six woes, but seven. And you know, when you get to chapter 6, there is a seventh woe. It's the famous woe in chapter 6, verse 5. Woe is me, for I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm, I'm living I'm in, uh, with a people of unclean lips. You see, Isaiah couldn't just go around saying, woe to you all the time. He couldn't just set everyone else straight. He couldn't just comment on everyone else's sin without ever confessing his own. Now, in this, the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah came to a point of total honesty about the fact that he was as big a sinner as anyone else, maybe bigger. And Isaiah did this, it's so striking, in the one area of life that he had most completely surrendered to God. If you had gone around in those days and asked people in Israel, who's the one person you can absolutely count on to tell you the truth, they would have said Isaiah the prophet. He might have said it himself. He might have said, yeah, there are, there are other areas of life where I struggle, but if there's one part of my life, indeed one part of my body that is totally dedicated to God, it is this mouth. Because Isaiah was, after all, a prophet. But here we find him admitting that he's a foul-mouthed sinner too. Suddenly it occurs to him that he is the one who uses bad language or employs his rhetorical skill to get other people to do what he wants or says something critical when he could have said something beneficial. And the very moment the prophet saw this, he said, woe is me, I am utterly undone. I have discovered that my mouth is just as filthy as anyone else's. They say that confession is good for the soul. I think if Isaiah's confession is good for our souls too. Because sometimes people on this campus do make critical comments. I think that will always be a temptation. At Wheaton College, we, we train people to think critically here in the very best sense of the word. We don't just take things for granted. We test them to see whether they are true. And I praise God for that. That's what education is all about in some ways. But if critical thought is not consecrated by humility, it becomes a critical spirit. And so at times we may be critical of chapel, critical of faculty members, critical of student organizations, critical of other people's friend groups, critical of people's theology or worship style or someone's performance or background or style or sense of humor. Have you, even this week, heard yourself utter criticisms in some of these areas? There's always someone or something to criticize, somebody who doesn't have it quite together the way that we do. And I suppose most of us will keep on criticizing unless and until God saves our ministry the way that he saved Isaiah's by showing us that our attitude is actually a bigger problem than whatever we think is wrong with everyone else. It wasn't wrong for Isaiah to pronounce God's judgment. He was a prophet. That was part of his job. But his biggest personal issue was his own sin. And there wasn't even one single area of life that he could say was perfect. Not even the things that he had tried the hardest to offer to God. 
And so before he could go out and do what God was calling him to do, here am I, send me, and all of that, first Isaiah had to come clean, and it started with saying, woe is me. I wonder this morning, what is the sin that you need to confess? Could it be that this morning or this week or this semester will be the time in your life when God saves your ministry? Maybe you need to say, woe is me, for I'm the person who loves so much for people to think more highly of me than they should. Woe is me, for I'm the person who tears people down instead of building them up. Woe is me, for I have very firm moral convictions in some areas, and I am willing to speak about them. But I like to make exceptions when I would rather do my own thing. Woe is me. For I am as sinful as Isaiah was, maybe worse. Now, to really understand how much trouble Isaiah was in, you have to see more than just the things that he had been saying to everyone else and the thing that he says about himself here. You have to understand what Isaiah was seeing at the moment that he said this. And these are some of absolutely the most awe-inspiring verses in the entire Bible, beginning at the beginning of Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. See if you can imagine this, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two... He flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. I go down these verses, I look at every single thing in them, and they are all totally awesome. God is awesome. Here we see Isaiah's vision of Almighty God, specifically God the Son. We know this because when John referred to Isaiah's ministry in his gospel, he said that the prophet saw the glory of Jesus Christ and spoke about him. Isaiah was seeing the awesomeness of God in the person of his only son. He saw God's throne, and that was awesome too. I get a little glimpse of this sometimes up here on the stage of Edmund Chapel because when students participate in chapel worship, and we have the big chair up here, which we don't actually have today, but they always hesitate to sit in it. I call these the Narnia chairs. They're kind of like the thrones of Care Paravel. <laughs> but people are usually a little bit in awe of the big chair. They, they come in and they know, that's, that's not for me. And so imagine what Isaiah felt when he went into the throne room of God and saw the throne of God, and he saw it high, lifted up, Jesus Christ sitting on the highest of all thrones, elevated and exalted, his robe equally awesome. Isaiah saw its train fill the temple. Just imagine for a moment a bride on her wedding day with her beautiful dress trailing behind her down the aisle, and then Imagine that filling the entire aisle and then spilling over into where the people are seated and pressing up against the walls of the church and then piling up towards the ceiling. Isaiah saw the train of the robe of the Lord who sits on the throne of God and it filled the temple. That's awesome. God's angels are awesome. Isaiah saw them as well, the mighty seraphim, these majestic beings which you would be tempted to worship if you saw them. And they are so overwhelmed by the greater holiness of God that they they cover themselves, these two wings over their faces, two wings over their feet, and with two other wings hovering in the holy presence of God. And what they say is awesome, holy, holy, holy. Repetition, as you may know, is the Bible's way of adding exclamation marks. And so when the angels repeat the word holy and then repeat it again, they're testifying to the absolute, total, pristine holiness of God. They are bearing witness in some way to the holiness of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
and the sound with which they uttered this praise, that also was awesome. Voices so mighty that they shook the very foundations of heaven. The whole temple was filled with smoke. That was awesome too. A total sensory experience of the awesomeness of God. And do you know this? Here is something else. Absolutely awesome. That that is what is happening right now. That these angelic beings are offering this very praise in the throne room of the universe. We know this because when the doors of heaven were thrown open for the Apostle John, as he describes in his famous book of Revelation, he saw living creatures worshiping God the Son. And the scripture says, each of them had six wings. And all day and night, they never ceased to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come, which sounds familiar because that's the same thing Isaiah heard, which I suppose is what the seraphim are always saying, which is totally awesome that there are these angels whose eternal employment is to worship the holiness of God. They have been doing this since the day they were created. They are doing it now. They will do it forever, offering God an infinity of holy praise. Now, can you even imagine what it was like for Isaiah to experience this? And can you see how much trouble he was in? You see, here in Isaiah 6, we have the juxtaposition of two absolute extremes. These two things coming together, the, the awesome holiness of God and the woeful guiltiness of his prophet. Nothing holier than the triune God, nothing unholier than the lips of a man who has been going around telling everyone else how unholy they are without confessing his own personal sin. Isaiah was caught in the middle of that in the throne room of God, and he was completely undone. He was totally shattered. He was absolutely broken. He was utterly ruined. And all he could say was, what was me? I am lost. I wonder, have you ever come to any similar place in your own life? That place of making a complete confession and admitting without any reservation that you are a sinner in the sight of God. See, this was Isaiah's trouble. It wasn't, it wasn't just this sin or that sin. It was his very identity as a sinner. He would never be holy enough for God. And anyone who catches even one little glimpse of God's true holiness knows immediately that he or she is in deadly peril. My hope for you is that you have been to a place like this in life, seeing yourself as woefully lost, seeing enough of the holiness of God, you know that you are a guilty sinner. And it's not just the bad thing that you did that you still feel guilty about, or the bad thing you do that you can't stop doing, or all the good things you know you should do but don't. It's, it's not just this or that, it's the trouble you, in, you are in because of the sinner that you are. So what do you do when you're in this kind of trouble? And is there anything God can do for you? Oh, well, that's, I suppose, the most awesome thing about this passage. First thing to do, of course, is just admit it. And that's what Isaiah did. He didn't try to defend himself. He didn't come up with a lot of excuses. He didn't say, yeah, Lord, I'm a sinner, but I, I just want to point out there's some other people around here that uh, break your covenant a lot more than I do. He didn't claim that his good deeds outweighed his bad deeds or that he always had good intentions, even if he failed to live up to them. Now, once he could see that massive canyon that separated him from the pristine holiness of God, he confessed his sin. And he did it in that one area of life where he had always prided himself for being particularly righteous. He had dedicated his life to speaking the pure words of God. But even there, he had fallen short. And so he confessed it. I am a man of unclean lips. I wonder what is the one area of your life where you would be tempted at least to pride yourself on giving everything to God? Whatever it is, music, sports, academics, ministry, this virtue or that virtue, there's not one 
single part of you that is perfectly protected from the stain of sin. I could give you lots of examples from my own life. We don't have all day, but let me just give you one. A few years ago, I was meeting with the interns from our church, people who were preparing for ministry, and for their spiritual help, I had a, a sort of list of temptations that people are particularly prone to when they are involved in some kind of ministry. And I read down the list, and I, I said to myself, yeah, yeah, that sin's tempting for me. Yeah, that, one, that one's pretty tempting too, except maybe that one. And the sin that I thought maybe wasn't so tempting for me was cynicism. I'm an optimist. I try to see the best in almost everything, so I don't think of myself as a particularly cynical person, but guess which sin I've been most convicted of since that very moment that night? Spiritual cynicism. Frankly, it's easy for me to criticize a Christian experience that seems shallow to me, or to inwardly, at least, throw a little cold water on something that I think people are more excited about than they ought to be. It's been convicting for me over these recent years. So here would be my challenge to you. Take one area of, area of life that you think at least a little bit you have dedicated to God. I mean, that's, that's maybe a stronger area for you in your own Christian experience. And ask the Holy Spirit to convict you of sin right there. Whatever you think is your best area. It won't take long, believe me. You'll see that you're in trouble there too. You're in trouble with sin everywhere. And this is part of God's grace to us because it gives us a chance to repent and hopefully we'll do it the way that Isaiah did when he freely confessed that he was a sinner to the very core. And really, that was the only thing he could do, confess his sin. There's nothing more that we can do to solve the trouble of our sin than simply to admit that we are guilty. But praise God, there is more that God can do, and he does it. And I mention it very briefly as we close. Notice how as soon as Isaiah confesses his sin, one of the seraphim flies to him. And in that angel's hand, there's a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. Every detail here is very significant. The angel presses that blazing ember against Isaiah's lips. And he says, look, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Oh, there's so much we could learn right here about the forgiveness of sin. These verses teach us we don't need to wait for God to forgive us. We are forgiven the moment we repent. And so when you feel guilty for any sin, don't delay. Run straight to God and make a confession right away. He is gracious to give, forgive. When God saw how much trouble Isaiah was in, what a woeful sinner he was, he did not destroy him. He saved him. Whatever the sin, confess it. And God's mercy will fly to you the way the angel flew to Isaiah. Learn as well that this mercy is for each and every sin. That's something else to learn here. Specific forgiveness for particular sins. It's so significant that the angel presses this coal to Isaiah's mouth. It was the very sin that Isaiah had confessed, unclean lips. Well, it must have been absolutely excruciating, but how effective it was because Isaiah's sin was totally purged, a confession followed by a cleansing in that specific area. We learn as well forgiveness is offered on the basis of blood. The angel brought that coal from an altar where sacrifice was made for sin, and that's the basis on which Isaiah's guilt was taken away and his sin atoned for. A lamb had been slain, blood had been spilt, a judgment fire had been lit, and only then were Isaiah's troubles over. I praise God this morning because all of that grace is available to us in Jesus Christ. When we are in trouble because we are guilty, not if, but when, there is a way for us to be saved. The moment we confess our sins, God flies to us with his forgiveness, and the Holy Spirit takes that atonement which Jesus accomplished and applies it directly to our sin. Pride, jealousy, lust, 
greed, envy, theft, dishonesty, prejudice. It's sad to say all of those sins will be committed on this campus today and tomorrow. But praise God, Jesus dealt with all of our troubling sins on the cross. And so we don't need to say, woe is me, any longer. We can say, thank you, Jesus. And we'll do that now in our worship. I invite Dan Quinn to come up again. We close with a hymn that we'll sing together before the throne of God. Let's stand as we sing together. Your life your life has been touched with the burning coal of God's grace are you therefore willing to stand before God and say what Isaiah said here am I send me go then in the mercy of Jesus Christ and in the power of his Holy Spirit amen